The 1973 U.S. Supreme Court case, Keys v. School District No. 1, brought the complex southern issue of school desegregation to the north and west. The Supreme Court reached a decision that addressed the responsibility of the school district to acknowledge the rights of its black and Hispanic students. The case provided a precedent for the definition of de jure and de facto segregation and established the beginning of policy on forced busing. In the political scene of the early 1970s, school desegregation was one of the most widely discussed topics. After Nixon's re-election in 1972, a new presidential era was due to begin and the public waited with anticipation to see what he would do with regard to the issue and how the outlook on school desegregation might change. In the election of 1968, Nixon's two main opponents were Democrat Hubert Humphrey and independent candidate George Wallace. Wallace, the governor of Alabama, represented the far right and was an advocate of segregation. In opposition to Wallace, Nixon initiated what became known as the Southern Strategy towards civil rights in effort to win a portion of the South's vote from Wallace. The strategy appealed to the importance that the South placed on states' rights and their hatred of forced busing, which was the process of sending children to non-neighborhood schools for the purpose of desegregation. Throughout the nation, most people were in favor of desegregation but against busing, and Nixon tried to tap this sentiment in his campaign. While anti-busing views were popular, this position offered no solution for desegregation. As a senator, Nixon voted for the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and clearly supported desegregation. Nixon's problem was with busing. He firmly believed that busing should not be used as a remedy and that forced integration was wrong. Nixon argued that the issue of segregated schools would not be solved with busing because it did not unite races and was harmful to education. In the election of 1972, Nixon made busing a prominent issue and it became virtually the only issue drawing heavy attention during the Democratic primaries. He began his second presidential term supporting many attempts to pass legislation restricting busing. The legislation that was ultimately passed banned the use of federal money for busing programs. The unitary school system must replace the dual school system uh, throughout the United States. The law having been determined, it is the responsibility of those in the federal government and particularly the responsibility of the President of the United States to uphold the law. The South questioned why the North was not experiencing segregation. However, as President Nixon said, why should we continue to kick the South and hypocritically ignore the same problems in the North? An important question arose. Was the goal desegregation or integration? Did schools simply have to eliminate race as a basis for assignment or actively achieve racial balance? Although progress was made toward ending legal segregation, natural segregation still existed due to housing patterns, school districts, and population movements. In the North, school segregation usually came about through the segregation of neighborhoods and housing. Minorities faced discrimination in housing and were pushed to the least desirable parts of the city. Because of their discontent with efforts to desegregate schools, the white population flooded to private schools to avoid it. Every neighborhood and school had a tipping point. This was the threshold at which whites would leave an area because the black population had increased to a certain percent of the entire population. Typically, the tipping was reached when a neighborhood became 50% black. This rapid relocation of whites was called white flight. Whites did not like having black neighbors and sought to maintain neighborhood purity, though they did not tend to move away from Hispanic or Asian neighbors. This was how de facto segregation, a segregation occurring naturally with no legal institution, came to be. A large number of blacks who came to Colorado after World War II settled in the previously white neighborhood of Park Hill on the east side of Denver. Due to white flight patterns, the area became extremely segregated. The school board proposed resolutions aimed at desegregating Park Hill and busing came into effect. Blacks were bused to the suburbs and whites were bused into the city. Whites objected violently, voicing concerns over education quality and safety in the predominantly black neighborhood. As a result, black school children were bused more than white children, despite the need for it to be a mutual process in order to achieve the goal of integration.
Hispanics, too, disapproved of busing and viewed it as a government action to reduce their power and influence by separating and weakening their communities. The emotionally fraught topic of busing brought a huge turnout of voters to the Denver School Board election in 1969. When the election resulted in the cancellation of the busing program, Wilfred Keyes filed suit in federal court against the Denver public school system. Wilfred Keyes, born in 1925, was a black chiropractor who grew up in the poor neighborhoods of Denver. He charged the school board with intentionally fostering a segregated system. The court found systematic segregation of students and teachers by the school board in 1970, and the plaintiff, Keyes, won the case. It was then appealed by Denver Public Schools and heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. The Supreme Court noted that the Denver School District had no written policy to segregate schools, but due to school assignment plans and locations, schools were segregated nevertheless. The court found that the school board's actions, which included gerrymandering attendance zones and building new schools, were proof that they had engaged in unlawful segregation for over a decade. The court decided that when school authorities made decisions that increased segregation, this was proof of promoting unlawful segregation. The school board was found responsible for making and enforcing policies that isolated black students. These decisions enforced segregation just as effectively as any specific segregation law would. The question then arose of de facto versus de jure desegregation. De facto segregation meant that segregation occurred naturally or without the law instituting it. De jure segregation meant that the segregation was statutory or produced as a result of policy. Discussions of the case appeared to support that de facto segregation was just as harmful as de jure. The question became whether de facto segregation was a constitutional violation as well. District courts were only allowed to administer acts such as busing in the case of a constitutional violation. Justice Lewis Powell, with the support of other members of the court, argued that the difference between the two terms was irrelevant. They rejected the difference between de jure and de facto because government action resulted in de facto segregation. The court eliminated the distinction and reached a compromise between the two. This allowed for a wider scope of actions to constitute de jure segregation instead of solely specific laws. Most of the school board's action fostering segregation affected the Park Hill area, but a question that now faced the court was whether this situation warranted mandatory desegregation of the entire district. The court decided that since the plaintiff proved that school authorities had caused segregation in one area, they would assume that they had caused segregation in the entire district. Now the courts had to prove that other parts of the district were not experiencing de jure segregation. Wilfred Keyes no longer had to prove de jure segregation at every school. When school segregation was found within a district to a substantial degree, school authorities were responsible for demonstrating that they had an integrated system. In June 1973, the Supreme Court declared that it was the responsibility of the Denver Public School District to desegregate all of its schools. Busing then began in Denver in 1974. After the Keyes decision, the precedent was set throughout the country and many district courts followed suit. However, many people doubted the beneficial impact of the Keyes trial. The district experienced a loss of white enrollment of almost 30% as white families fled to suburbs outside of the city by the thousands. Opponents argued that the Keyes decision discouraged northern schools from desegregating because the amount of evidence required in court was discouraging many potential plaintiffs from even going to court. Nevertheless, Keyes undoubtedly shaped desegregation history. The Keyes v. School District No. 1 trial shifted attention to the problem of desegregation along with forced busing from the South to the entire nation, and it removed the distinction between de jure and de facto segregation. Keyes established that actions promoting racial segregation in one school within a district could render the entire system accountable for segregation. This case changed the perspective of district executives and influenced views on desegregating schools. Many suburban Denver area schools today are still somewhat segregated, which raises questions about the actual success of Keyes. <laughs>